Now, as to the story itself, the Holy Land Foundation was the largest Muslim charity in America at one point. And it was established by uh, some, probably some of the finest men I've ever met. And they were, I mean, they are Palestinian Muslims who ended up in this country like all immigrants, uh, or many immigrants. They came to school here, they got married, they started a family, and they remained. Um, and when it came time to give back, then the Holy Land Foundation was what they created. And then the Holy Land Foundation was also a, a vehicle for other people, th through which other people gave back, Muslims, because, because charity is, 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 is an important tenant in the Muslim faith. <coughs> Um, and they worked uh, very well. They they grew very fast. They gained an incredibly an incredible reputation. Every time they were um, every time they um, they had they were uh, what's the word? There are different agencies that that, that, that monitor uh, relief organizations and so forth. They always came out with the highest rate highest highest rates uh, highest rating that was possible as a relief organization. They were. Um, they created alliances with other relief organizations around the world, um, and other organizations here in the United States. And they 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 developed a stellar reputation. And in many ways, that was their demise. Because the reality here in the United States, because of their relationship with Israel, is such that everything that's Palestinian has to be somehow conflated with terrorism. So, um, whether you try to put on a, a play by a Palestinian playwright, or whether you try to put on a, some of you may remember there was a, it was quite famous, there was this um, children's uh, drawings, an exhibit that was going around the country. Nobody could, you couldn't host it because, it, you know, right away the letters and the emails and, you know, the, the, the claims of anti-Semitism and terrorism and so forth. So every, anything that's Palestinian has to always be connected to that, and it is, that's the reality. And somehow the relief, this relief organization was living in a sphere where that, it wasn't touched by that. Um, but thankfully there are the agents of the Zionist movement and the state of Israel hard at work, these watchdog groups like the Anti-Defamation League, which pretends to be a kind of a civil rights organization, but it's really a terribly racist and violent organization supporting the state of Israel, of course. Um, and people like Chuck Schumer and Anthony Weiner and other Zionist politicians who um, who saw to it that they w that 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 the reputation of the Holy Land Foundation was undermined. So they began with newspaper articles, and then they approached the IRS to um, revoke their not-for-profit license, or not yeah not-for-profit uh, status. And um, they went and started talking to some of the other. Uh, organizations and uh, that they were uh, that had alliances with and to jeopardize that and little by little by little they created this story that the Holy Land Foundation was sending money to Hamas and that the members of the Holy Land Foundation were were terrorists and terrorist supporting um, and as this was this so this was going on throughout the 90s the mid 90s early mid 90s and then also throughout the 90s, during the Clinton administration, Hamas was designated a terrorist organization. And this whole issue of uh, sending money to terrorist organizations and financing terrorism became a big deal here. It became an issue. And then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 took place, there was this uh, really a state of panic here in Washington, DC. And I don't know if you've ever heard of or seen the uh, biography of uh, Paul O'Neill, who was Treasury Secretary at the time. But the sense of chaos, the sense of we got to do something fast, we got to arrest somebody, we have to a free mm -hmm. some assets, we got to do something, and we need to do it all without due process, without having to go through due process. We have to figure out ways to get somebody um, and to show that we're doing something without having to worry about due process. And that's exactly what they did. And so rounding up the usual suspects is what they kind of that was what they decided to do and the top of the suspect list was Holy Land Foundation. They're Palestinians, they're Muslims, and they're sending money to Palestine. So obviously they're terrorists. And in December of 2001, President Bush announced 
uh, without due process, but using an executive order that this is a terrorist organization and they were closed down and all their assets were frozen. And they had a lot of money in the bank because it was right after Ramadan. Now, when I spoke to the lawyers and they told me their part of this and they told me that part of the story, what amazed them and then what also amazed me is that the guys were not, they were not concerned. They didn't think, you know, they perfectly understood that at that point in time in the United States, there's panic, there's fear, people are acting in an unrational way. But they understood and they said, look, we did everything fine. We, we have all the evidence. We did nothing wrong. This is America. We have a good justice system here. We're, it's gonna be, we're gonna be fine. They really believed that the fact that they did nothing wrong was going to be helpful to them, was going to save them. And that they have, that they were able to account for every dime they, that passed through their, uh, their organization, where it came from, where it ended up. They only worked with organizations that were vetted and approved by the United States, by the CIA, by the State Department. In other words, they had it all, they knew exactly what they were doing. So um, they sued the government, which is what we do when the government acts arbitrarily. They sued the government here in Washington, D.C. And the judge dismissed the case and struck all of their evidence from the record. And I'll never forget the minute I was sitting with one of their lawyers, his office is in, um, in Albuquerque. And when he told me that, I thought, what? A judge can just do that? They can just, they can just dismiss the case and strike the evidence? And he says, well, she did. And that, obviously, it's very problematic. I mean, the Holy Land Foundation had a, an enormous body of evidence showing exactly how they did everything right. And that there was not a shred of evidence they did anything wrong. They didn't support any political or military organization, certainly not Hamas. The government presented what's called an administrative record, which is where they present their case and why they did what they did. And I won't use the words that the lawyers used to describe what was in that uh, administrative record, but they're basically newspaper articles and um, uh, statements that were sent over, faxed over from the government of Israel, from the Israeli police. Nothing was under oath, nothing was notarized. Um, and some things, and some documents where people were claiming that these guys were members of Hamas or something. But one of the statements that they had in the administrative record was a little bit troubling. They said that they had a statement from one of the employees of Holy Land Foundation in Jerusalem, the guy who ran their office, Muhammad Anati. The name Anati came up when I was when I was you know talking to people a lot. The Anati statement that was a problem. Why? Because in the statement that the Israeli police sent over to the prosecutions, to the, to the government here in the US, according to that statement, he said that, well, actually from time to time, they did favor Hamas and they did give some money to people who were part of Hamas. So obviously the lawyers were concerned. So they, now Mohammed Anati was arrested by the Israelis and harassed on that side of the, on that side of the world as well. So they contacted his lawyer, really well-known Israeli human rights lawyer, Elat Semel, who's been defending Palestinians for decades. And she said, what are you talking about? I have, all of his, uh, I have all of his statements. He said, no such thing. So she sent over all of his statements, and I saw the records in her office. Um, they had them here translated by a professional translation firm, notarized. You know, they had to sign under oath. <laughs> and they looked at his statements and he said the exact opposite. He said, we never gave money to any group, any organization based on um, any, in other words, any political or military organizations, only based on need. Now, the correct translation was in the evidence that was struck from the record. The wrong translation was in the government's administrative folder, which was accepted. That was the reality. So they went to appeal. Now mind you, this is just the beginning of the case. This is around 2002, 2003. This is just the beginning. So they went to appeal, and the appellate court said, well, perhaps the judge should not have struck the evidence from the record. However, this is not a normal case. And that's, that was the moment when their lawyers realized their clients were not, getting, were not gonna get a fair trial. 
there's no way Muslim Palestinians in America were getting a fair trial. That moment where the judges said, however, however, this is not a normal case. This is uh, national security, and therefore they upheld the ruling of the court. Anyway, so, um, so that was that. <clears throat> and then the lawyers heard that there was a criminal case being, uh, um, being put together. And they thought, how could there be a criminal case? There was no crime. They didn't break the laws, they paid their taxes. I mean, what could they possibly, what could, what possible crime could they be accused of? So what the government did was this. They realized that they could not accuse them of giving money to Hamas because they didn't give money to Hamas. There's no record, and all the record shows is where the money went. So they said, well, they didn't give money to Hamas, but they give money to organizations that are controlled by Hamas, and that's the same thing. Now, Holland Foundation, just like all other relief organizations, work with local charities on the ground in Palestine, called Zakat Committees. Every city has one, every town has one, and um, that's who they worked with, like everybody else. The Zakat Committees, the prosecution claim, are controlled by Hamas. And to prove this, they brought in thousands and thousands of documents were brought in from the government of Israel. Come on, oh, please. Um, and two expert witnesses, and this became, this is something that everybody knows about the case. Two expert witnesses were, were brought in from Israel. One was an officer in the Israeli military intelligence, and one was an officer in the Israeli secret police, the Shabak. And they testified anonymously which is, of course, a violation of the Constitution and should never be allowed. And it was the first time in the history of the United States that this was permitted in a court of law, that expert witnesses were allowed to uh, testify anonymously. Now, all of this is beyond terrible, beyond wrong. But even with all of that, um, the defense attorneys were able to examine and <coughs> cross-examine these witnesses and show Clearly, they knew nothing about the issue at hand. In other words, they they talked about all the, the all the committees that were that were listed in the indictment, and they said, "Well, have you visited the, their offices? No. Do you know who their me board members are? No. Do you know who the past board members are, were? No. Do you know? I mean, they didn't know anything about anything. But their claim was, and this was said in a court of law. And again, this is another one of those things that a lot of people heard and know about the case." is that these two Israeli experts said, we don't need all the evidence because we can smell Hamas. And that's good enough. Now, one of the things that I was concerned about as I was writing this book, as I was working on this, what I didn't want to happen is for people to say, well, yeah, of course, Miko loves that. He, you know, he's a Palestinian lover. Of course, he's going to be on their side. You know. So what I did was I read over 20,000 pages of court transcripts. And I fully intended to put most of them, if not all of them, in the book. Because people, you have to read this, of course, the publisher wouldn't have it. But you have to read the court transcripts to believe what goes on in a court of law. You know, everything is transcribed, which is really, really good. So you read all the nonsense, all the technicalities, but also all the, all the stuff that goes on. You know, I mean, at one point, one of the lawyers, um, she puts her head down and she's just like, oh my God, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And the judge, you know, reprimands her, he says, this is unbecoming, you know. Put your head up. You can't do this in the court. I mean, little things like that. The frustration of the defense team was beyond belief. They could not do anything right. There was no way that their um, that their clients were going to get a fair shot. And um, so that was so so that was that was the reality. Now, one other thing, another thing that I asked myself was how does how did they even come up with this idea? How did they come up with this notion or this argument? that a relief organization is supporting terrorism. I mean, it doesn't come to mind immediately. It's not the first thing you think of, right? Somebody had to sit in a room and say, let's see, how are we going to do this? Aha, I have an idea, and then come up with the idea. So what they did, and what they're still doing today, by the way, this is, a, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, an argument uh, that's being made even today about relief organizations when it comes to Palestine. They said, well, Holy Land Foundation had a program supporting orphans. Well, there you go. 
by supporting these orphans, you're supporting terrorism. Not only are you supporting terrorism, and this was said by terrorism experts, people who sit here in Washington, D.C. on think tanks and advise the president. I've got, you know, Matthew Levitt. I mean, people that are like well-known, they're on CNN, sitting there and saying, supporting these orphans is not just supporting terrorism, it's encouraging terrorism. Because if a parent knows that their family, their child is going to get a stipend of 50 bucks a month, of course they're going to join and become a, blow themselves up. I mean, that's normal, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't we all do the same thing? Isn't this like how what people do? This was an argument under oath by experts who were paid, by the way, quite well. It's like 250 bucks an hour. And there are a lot of hours of testimony sitting there and testifying and saying these things that this is not only supporting terrorism, it's encouraging terrorism. And it was said over and over and over again. Still, the first trial ended with no convictions. They could not get convictions, which to the, tip, the government, of course, was a big blow. The president said these guys were terrorists, and the prosecutors couldn't convict even one of them. So, you know, there's a problem here. Now, of course, the problem is that the president said something, even though there was no proof, he lied. There was no reason to say that. Now the prosecutors had to figure out how to make it, make, it, make it all stick, and they couldn't, even in that under those conditions. So then they declared a mistrial, and there was a second trial, which is a big mistake. And um, in the second trial, the judge, the second judge, allowed even more evidence and more witnesses and more testimony than the first judge. In other words, things that were even, even things that the first judge did not allow the second judge allowed. And I did an interview with Ralph Nader last week, and he said, it sounds like the second judge was what they call a hanging judge. That's exactly what he was. That's I mean, the first judge, I think, was a hanging judge, but the second judge, without, I mean, he just pulled out all the stops. The, the prosecution got whatever, whatever they wanted, and the defense got nothing. They could not object. None of their objections were accepted. They, could, they got absolutely nothing. Um... And then the end of the second trial, they were all convicted. They ended with all convictions. So then uh, they went to appeal. And they appealed because they said, look, the second judge allowed all these pieces of evidence and all this testimony that should not have been allowed. So the appellate court came back and said, well, perhaps the judge should not have allowed these pieces of evidence. However, it was harmless. So the defense said, what do you mean harmless? First trial, no convictions. This evidence was kept out. Second trial, this evidence was permitted. All convictions. How can you say it was harmless? That was the end of the conversation. Supreme Court wouldn't take the case. Uh, President Obama would not commute their sentence, even though there was a, a deal that was put together if they could be deported. There were several countries that were willing to accept them and give them citizenship. Of course, who wouldn't? Great people like that. Who wouldn't be glad to have them as citizens? Uh, but it was obvious Obama was not going to do it. He was not going to commute five convicted Palestinian terrorists. And so, um, and so that was uh, that was that was the end of that. And, and and the type of arguments like this 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 whole thing with uh, with the um, uh, the orphans is is it w that was how the whole trial was was put together. Now the, what the defense team did, they took a look at the list of these orphans and the cause of death of the fathers, and none of them died as of, from what you might call terrorism. I mean, natural causes, accidents, things like that. I went and I looked at a list of some 300 Palestinians who participi participated in, in uh, suicide missions during those years when, when these were taking place, and none of them had children. So either way, you look at this, or these orphans, they're, they're becoming orphans had nothing to do with, with what you might call terrorism. And of course, the Zakat committees were, um, you know, the local charities were vetted. They were approved by the CIA. They had the former uh, Consul General of Jerusalem, the U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, testify for the defense, saying that the Zakat committees were fine. The Holy Land Foundation was known to be a good organization. Nothing was going to help these guys. And so we have five good men, five, no, probably the five finest men I've ever met. Um, I'll briefly tell you a little bit about them. One of them is uh, Mohammed al-Mizain. He's the oldest of the group. He's in his 70s, kind 
kind of he was kind of the wise man, the spiritual kind of inspiration behind the whole thing. And um, I met him in prison. His family's in San Diego. He's got a big family. And um, one of the times that I met him in jail was right after uh, Obama, uh, Trump was elected, and Ted Cruz and some other senators wanted to they they uh, they wanted to pass a law that would designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. So we're talking about this. We're in prison. He's, you know, he's a big man. He's you, you, like he sits in front of you. A big strong <coughs> man is sitting in front of you, not some poor guy who's you know sitting in, in jail. You don't get the sense that you're sitting with somebody who's in prison. You know, he feels more, you know, stronger and, and, and more free than any one of us. And uh, he says to me, we're, so we're talking about this, uh, this law, and he says, I'm a Muslim brother. They're not going to change me. This is nonsense. And I'm thinking, cameras everywhere. Every word we say is, is recorded. Prison guards everywhere. He's wearing this prison, these prison clothes. He can't go to the bathroom without asking permission. He's in jail, in federal prison, for 15 years. And he doesn't care. He's, he, he is who he is. He's his own man. He's like completely, completely unoccupied, completely unimprisoned. You know? Um, so that's him. The second one, uh, Abdurrahman Ode, also got 15 years. Had nothing to do with this organization in terms of managing or organizing. I mean, he would volunteer. He went on missions, he volunteered. But from very early on, the, the FBI came to him and wanted him to collaborate, to work with us. And every time he said, no, 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 no. They came to his house at 5 o'clock in the morning. They came to his office. They stopped him on the highway. They caught him uh, returning from uh, overseas before he would get on a plane. I mean, nonstop. And he kept saying, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Until finally they said, you have to pay for this. And then he heard that he, his name was included in the indictment. Then they came to him and wanted to cut a deal. And they offered him a deal when the trial began. Three years and he's out if he's willing to talk. But it comes with a gag order. So he said, you want me to cut a deal which will implicate my friends and I will be bound by a gag order. No thank you. Three years for terrorism charge, that's pretty good. It, they kept coming and coming to him until they finally offered him six months. And the other guys, who by the way told me the story, he, didn't, he told me the story too, but that was later. They told me the story first, the other guys. And they said to him, take the deal, six months, you'll be out. We don't all have to go to jail. Um, but he said to the feds, gag order, absolutely not. Now he's in federal prison for 15 years, and he's sitting in front of me again in these overalls. He can't go to the vending machine to get a drink or, or to the bathroom without, he can't go to the vending machine at all. All he had to go, because they have vending machines in the visitation rooms. Uh, and he says to me, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm free man. I sleep well at night, no regrets. 15 years, he's got children, you know? 15 years, you have a kid who's five, you come out, he's 20. And the treatment, the solitary confinement, they're in solitary all the time, in and out for no reason. I mean, the treatment is horrifying. And it's, it's most, a lot of, most of it's in the book. And then, uh, third one, Mufid Abdul Qadir, he also had nothing to do with the organization. But he would volunteer, come to events, do fundraising, you know, fun stuff. Uh, but he has a brother. And his brother's name is Khaled Mash'al. Oh. And Khaled Mash'al was the head of the political bureau of Hamas for many years. Now, in the opening statement, the prosecutor said, family connections are not a reason to convict. We do not convict because of family connections. Then they brought expert witnesses from the FBI, under oath testifying, that in terrorism cases, in terrorism organizations, family connections are very important. Very important. So there you had it. Still, he was found not guilty of all charges after the first trial. There were 32 charges. And his wife told me the judge called out not guilty 32 times. But when the prosecutor polled the jury, one of the jurors decided is that she didn't agree, she didn't change her mind, she didn't like it. She said, no, 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 I changed my mind, I made a mistake. So even though the foreman showed clearly she signed, uh, just like everybody else did, the defense team objected, nothing helped. The judge called a mistrial on him as well, and he's serving 20 years in federal prison. 
So he was, not only he's innocent, but he was found innocent. 20 years in federal prison. And then um, the heart and soul of the organization, the CEO, the guy who really made it all work, was Shukri Abu Bakr. And he's also the first one I um, communicated with. And I know his family well. He, we kind of got along and became really good friends. He's got a blog, by the way, if anybody wants to read it. Um, and um, he, when the, pro when the prosecution made their opening statement, they said Hamas was established in 1987, Hoyland Foundation was established in 1987. There you have it. There's a connection right there. And they said this seriously. In other words, it sounds absurd, but this is, this is how they presented their case. What they didn't say were two other things. Number one, the Intifada, the first Palestinian uprising began in 1987. There was a serious need, severe need for relief, um, which is what prompted the start of the Hoyland Foundation. And also, Shukri, one of Shukri's daughters, his third daughter, was born uh, in 1987, Sanabil. And she was born with several life threatening diseases. And they had to avail themselves of the services of children's hospitals and all these charity hospitals. And he was suddenly introduced to this world of charitable giving and, and, and charity hospitals and so forth. And he decided that's what he wants to do and he wants to provide that sort of thing for Palestinians. And that motivated him. And throughout her whole life, and I dedicated the book to Sanabil, uh, to, to her memory. Um, she lived to, tw to be 26. And um, she was like his, his inspiration. And the first, time I met, first few times I met the families, she was like so excited about me writing the book. And you know, she wrote him this email. I put it in the book. You know, it was an exciting email. How the, you know, I'm going to be writing a book about this case and how wonderful it is and so on. And he, you know, she passed away while he was in prison. So that was his inspiration and his motivation. But of course, these things were not mentioned. Um, and I visited him also. But he's got 65 years. 65 years in federal prison, and he's in Port, he's in Beaumont, Port Arthur. It's one of the most, if not the most dangerous prison in America, high security prison. It's beyond horrifying, beyond horrifying. And the last one, Hassan Elashi, who I did not meet, and for some reason the, the prison authorities didn't allow me to meet him, um, also provided me a lot of stories, a lot of great information, wonderful man, I met his family, um, and, um, <coughs> There's a story, I'll share a little anecdote, it's in the book, but it has to do with, with uh, Hassan and just the reality in the prison. So this moment where uh, they blow the whistle and they say inmates on one side, families on the other side. Their youngest son, Omar, has Down syndrome and he was a little boy. And when the separation happened, he wasn't ready, so he, he shouted, Baba, Daddy, and ran to his dad and grabbed his legs. So of course, everybody in the prison, he was like, oh my God, total silence. And so of course he picked him up and the mom came and took him and all this. And um, Hassan was disciplined. And the consequence was six months, no visitation. So that's kind of, that's the reality. That's like the day-to-day -day stuff, you know? It's horrifying if you are guilty, if you, are, if you did commit a crime. Imagine being innocent. And this is the small little thing, you know, one of the things that make their daily life, these people's life in prison. So it's really, really horrifying. And really, going back to the beginning, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for Israel's influence and the relationship between Israel and the United States. None of this would have happened. If they were not Palestinians, if they were not Muslims, they'd not be in jail. There's no doubt about it. They're innocent. Their only crime is if they're Palestinians and they're Muslims. And they were sending money to Palestine. And, um, and, go, and again, going back to this whole issue of sending money and supporting orphans or supporting fam families of prisoners, they made the same argument with support for families of prisoners because they're saying, well, you're encouraging terrorism, you're giving the families money. So of course these guys are going to become terrorists. And now um, you know, Israel shut down the Palestinian National Fund, which has been around for decades. And one of the things the Palestinian National Fund does is it, pay, is it gives stipends to the families of prisoners the vast majority of whom have never even been involved with acts of violence. The vast majority of Palestinians in Israeli jails are political prisoners. They've never even been accused of violence. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, since it worked, <coughs> since it worked, they've been doing more and more and more of this and kind of expanding on these things. Since Holy Land Foundation was such a success at the end of the day. And of course now there's lots of stories like this, more stories than, than you could possibly tell. 
And so, um, as though it's not enough, Palestine has been occupied brutally. Palestinians are being killed, dispossessed, arrested, um, living in refugee camps for seven decades, forgotten by the world, in, in unbelievably horrifying conditions, terrible poverty, living at the whims of all kinds of regimes that kill them and bomb them and give them no freedom and no access to life and no access to human rights. And all this because they're banned from returning to their homes in Palestine, which very often is in maybe an hour drive or two hours drive. Even when they come here, start a new life, their kids are here, they're not going to go back to Palestine. Israel doesn't have to worry about them. They're still persecuted and prosecuted and end up in jail and in fear. Today, it's practically impossible to get a, f a fundraiser for Palestine or to even talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. You know, try to put a lecture, you know, talk about this issue in a mosque. It, people don't want to come and talk. People are afraid. And they have good reason to be afraid. So it was a big success. So this is, this, I think, a reality that is, uh, you know, for all people of conscience, this is very, very troubling. And um, I'll say two more things, and then if you have any questions. Um, I think it's important. Is anybody is anybody here from Palestine? A few people. Anybody been to Palestine? Okay, everybody almost. <laughs> so um, <coughs> it's interesting when people talk about Palestine. They usually say Israel Palestine, or if they visited, they say I've been to Israel Palestine. I've been to Israel. <coughs> I've been to you know they kind of they use both names. And I think it's important to. Um, check with our values, and the name that we use to call the country should be a reflection of our values. It's got nothing to do with politics or religion, is what I'm saying. If we oppose racism, if we oppose violence, if we oppose ethnic cleansing and genocide, if we um, believe in justice, then we cannot accept the name Israel and we have to call a country Palestine. Using the name Israel legitimizes what Israel has done. So many people think that what Israel has done is fine. They're kicking out Palestinians and you know, destroying Palestine and building a state for the Jewish people and all that is, is fine. That's their values. They call it Israel. But calling the country Israel legitimizes all of the crimes that Israel has committed. So when I talk to people, after a while they realize I don't use the name Israel, I use the name Palestine, and I go, are you just saying Palestine? I mean, are you talking about the whole country? <laughs> I think it has to be, I think that's how we make that distinction. I think it's really, really important. And so we don't need to always say Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, it's Palestine, and it's occupied. And it's been occupied for more than 70 years now. And that's the name of the game. And that's how we start the conversation and that's how we move beyond this confusion of what is actually going on there. And then, um, and then the other part I think of the clarity that is really, really important is uh, is BDS, which is why I always wear this button. There's a conversation here in DC and in other places of, about is it legitimate? Is it anti-Semitic? Is it racist? Is it this? Is it that? Well, look at the look at the demands. I mean, it's very simple. The call for BDS came with very specific demands. They're written down. Anybody can check them. Anybody can see them. They're not that hard to, you know, to read. They're very simple. Um, and so the demand, the, the call for BDS, first of all, came from Palestinians. So that already, I think, for the rest of us, is, is a call. It's, it's a call to duty. It's a call to do something um, from the very people who need, need something to be done. Um, and it's not just solidarity, it's actual action, it's actual resistance. You know, I think the time for solidarity is long past. I think what's required is, if we care about Palestine, is action and, and, and resistance, and BDS is exactly that. But the demands of the call for BDS are the right of return of the refugees, <coughs> something that, you know, repatriating refugees has already happened in the world, resettling refugees. It's not the first time refugees were allowed to go back to their homes. Um, and it's been enshrined in UN resolution. Uh, ending the military occupation, which again, there's a consensus around the world for that. And uh, equal rights for Palestinians with the Jews who live in Palestine, Israelis. 
Where's the anti-Semitism? It's basically justice, freedom, and equality. And how, how is that problematic? I mean, where, how does that not sit well with Jewish values? Chuck Schumer decided that it was anti-Semitic. It's a new form. He says it's a new form. It's just kind of a sneaky anti-Semitism. You know, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. It's all remedial. It says nothing about kicking anybody out or deporting or killing or anything. It's all remedial. This is the other things that need to happen to fix what has happened in Palestine for the last seven decades. Um, so I think it's extremely important that BDS become this thing that we talk about freely and we support and we participate in. Whether it's just not buying stuff at Trader Joe's because they sell this new whatever Israeli product, or we go to the manager and we sell, or we, or we send letters or we start a campaign, you know, whatever it is. Of course, the, the more we do, the better. The more involved we are, the better it is. And the more we talk to our friends and our neighbors and and probably the one comment that I hear the most in, when I say this is, yes, but, but our Jewish friends, you know, we got these Jewish neighbors, or my son-in-law is Jewish, or my best friend, and, and they get kind of insulted and hurt. Well, yeah. well, let them get be insulted. I mean, what can I say? You know what I mean? This is the right thing to do. You either do the right thing or you don't do the right thing. If somebody gets insulted when you, when you want to support justice, then they have a problem, you know? So I think these are, this is a, incredibly important, and there's a c connection here. There's an absolute connection here between the case of the Holy Foundation, you know, kids, Palestinian kids who grew up in, in extreme poverty in refugee camps, even though there's absolutely no reason in the world why they should do that. Palestinians in the Nekab Desert who are denied water. I'm not even talking about Gaza, I'm talking about Israeli citizens, citizens of Israel in the Nekab Desert, who are denied water and electricity and health care um, and all, any other rights that you could possibly imagine, education. It's all connected, it's all the same thing, and we're never gonna be able to fix one unless we fix it all, you know? Somebody asked me today about this thing with, uh, you know, the U.S. is not gonna fund UNRWA anymore. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, $300 million a year, but still, and the poverty in the refugee camps is, is horrifying, but still, you know, what do we do? I mean, what do we do? We fight, we f BDS is what we do. We make sure that the world knows that there's an injustice here. You're not gonna be able to fix one thing at a time. I think it has to be systemic. So I invite all of you to call Palestine Palestine again and to do everything you can and support PDS. Thank you. Mm -hmm.